I'm going to say one thing. Uh, oh, no, you've got you one. Oh, no, there's one there for you, sir, as well. Yes. Yes, son. It should be on. Oh, me, me, me. Mama, mama, No actor can sing like that, can they? No. <laughs> I've, I've only got one thing to say. Gordon's alive! <laughs> Anyway, this young man's going to ask me lots of questions. I have to say, uh, of course, that uh, I'll sit here with you. Please, take it take out of you. There's some water there as well. If you... Thank you. Oh. <laughs> I don't want to Yeah, it's okay. No trouble. Let me get close. <laughs> you know, it's uh, looking at these and my voice. Uh, come in! This is your last chance without pain. <laughs> That's it. You've missed my sex life. <laughs> it wasn't very long. <laughs> in you come. Uh, uh, as regards voices um, and my voice, uh, years ago I was. Uh, I said, Kenneth Branagh always says, "You're fearless. You climb Mount Everest." Three times, read to the North Pole. You're the oldest man to reach the magnetic North Pole. There's no end to my adventures. And you're not scared of anything. And then one day, uh, Granada Television were doing stars in their eyes. <laughs> and they said, um, Brian, we want you to be Pavarotti. And I said, no. And Branner, Kenneth Branner said, well, for the first time, you are bloody scared. You're scared shit. I said, no, I'm not. I said, but when I was in Cats, as old Deuteronomy, in London, at the original production of Cats, uh, I met Pavarotti, I met Domingo, Carreras, and De Stefano. And they all bowed to Pavarotti and called him Maestro. I said, but well, why do you call him Maestro? You know, I said, well, I said, Domingo, ah, he's superior to us all. I have a fruity voice. A Domingo told me. Carreras, he has a cloudy voice. De Stefano is sharp. But Placida, Placida said, but there is no doubt. Pavarotti, his voice is perfection. From bass C to top C. No one is like him. So we call him Maestro and we bow to him. That's why Hyde Park everywhere. So I said to Ken Brother, oh, that's why I said no. Nobody's got his voice. And anyway, <clears throat> it was a charity. <clears throat> it was a charity. Uh, and um, they offered me 50,000 quid. I said no. Uh, 100,000 quid now. And, and eventually went to 750,000 quid. So I thought, I thought, oh, sorry, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, anybody see that at all? I, a few years ago, the dress, the costume was not dissimilar to this. Uh, and uh, you know that you go through a cloud as Brian Blessed, then you come back as a character. And the makeup was wonderful, the bl big black wig, padding extra, and so forth. And as I came through, I looked just like Pavarotti. Masterful makeup. <laughs> People cheered. And then they thought, they stopped cheering. I thought, well, he looks like him. <laughs> <laughs> but he never sounded like him. And I stepped forward through <clears throat> that mess and went, Mona di cielo, che bello in me, oh, solo mio, stand up from the earth, oh, sole, oh, sole mio. There you are. How about that? <laughs> saying is, my sweethearts, I've come here because I love science fiction. Also, I think that the saying Gordon's alive is 
When I say it's all over the world, everywhere, the Queen, you know, at Buckingham Palace. Uh, one Christmas with all the children. You know, Mr. Blessed, she said, you know. <laughs> oh, by the way, when she did give me the OBE and all that, you know, you know what OBE means, don't you? Other buggers' efforts. Anyway, <clears throat> when I got the OBE from her, she talked to me for a long time. And you was at 10 said, What did she say to you? She said, I do believe it. I hear that you imitate me all the time. I said, no, I don't. She said, you're such a bloody liar. <laughs> and that's what the Queen said to me. Anyway, so what was that? Uh, I was talking about uh, singing and this. Um, but <clears throat> wherever I go, this Gordon's Alive is somehow a clarion call to happiness. Look at this age at the moment. Look at that rubbish they give us. Look at, the, you're here because you're fighting it. Because one of the healthiest things that we have is being primitive. Tattoos, the ladies, makeup, jewelry, all this. It's healthy to be primitive. It has great sophistication. So when you dress up and do things, there's nothing wrong with you, mates. It's healthy and good. But Gordon's alive, and when I go, surprise me, is a clarion call, you know, for freedom, for happiness. So, I mean, I was actually heading for, because um, I'm 50% actor and 50% uh, uh, explorer. And uh, one of my expeditions was the magnetic North Pole. Really bloody hard. And we've been in it for five months. And gradually, I was the oldest man ever, and to my talents, uh, and we got very close to the magnetic North Pole. My hair stood on end with the electricity, which happens. And the ice is thin, and a great typhoon submarine like Sean Connery's Red October came through the ice. Amazing. <clears throat> and I've got this captain and saw us, and he said, Oh, it's him. Please, Sir Gordon's alive. <laughs> so here was this Russian captain, and Gordon's alive! <laughs> Thank you very much. Come on board, Mr. Blessed. I went on board in summary, and I sang the Volga Boatman. Yo heave ho, yo ho ho, yo heave ho, yo heave ho. Let's move around. Anyway, <laughs> so. <clears throat> I want to make something clear straight away. I am sick to death of people saying, you know, that Flash Gordon, the film, is camp. <laughs> it's a great film. It's got great music. Queen's music is great. Even in Star Wars, you have black skies. In Flash Gordon, you've got purple, green, the man, all kinds of colors. It has great style throughout. Marvelous cars, ideal. Uh, you know, I'd always seen it as a child with Buster Crabbe. I was born in Mexico, Yorkshire, lived in Goldthorpe in the war years. And once a week in the Empire Picture House, we went to see Buster Crabbe in black and white with Flash Gordon. And it was a wonderful one episode after another. I never dreamt. You must follow your dreams, ladies and gentlemen. I never dreamt that eventually I would actually play Voltaire. I walked into a studio at Pinewood where they were casting it, and there was a great portrait of Voltaire. I said, well, just a minute, you, you have cast me already. No, said Dino Olympics. No, but that is Voltaire. But that's me. Yeah, I know. That is you. You are Voltaire. And it was a kind of miracle, the whole thing. But the show has got style, got cast, got music, got direction, and it is a great, great movie. And it will go on and on and on throughout the world. From Queens to Kilimanjaro to the snow regions to Mount Everest, people want me to say Gordon's alive because people want to be alive. And we're fighting in this day and age, we're going to succeed. We are going to have a marvelous world. We are going to go to the other planets. It's great. But the web telescopes out there, amazing, the web telescope is now reaching out to the far reaches, 
of the universe and of the galaxy. Amazing. It's bringing back all kinds of information. Trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions, and trillions, and trillions of stars like our sun and planets like ours all throughout the galaxies. So it's a miraculous age. We're, gonna, we're really babies. We're just beginning. So all this toss pot shite that one hears on the news. Come on, come on, go. I'm sick of all this negative news. We are going to make it. We are going to save the animals. Why then they said, does Brian talk about space and this, that, and the other? I'll give you a feeling. One, you have just traveled 61,000 kilometers in one second. The whole of the solar system is traveling at that kind of speed. So you are astronauts, cosmonauts. You've got no choice. You are space travelers. But just think, tomorrow morning when you wake up, you'll be in a different part of the universe. When you wake up tomorrow morning. And that's the great future that we have. And I am part of it and love it. And I said, therefore, I'm delighted uh, to be in Plash Gordon, delighted to be in a space film, even Boss Mass. Uh, you know, um, interesting in Star Wars, there's that marvelous sequence where uh, we attack Rocket Ship Ajax. You know, that bit where we um, attack Rocket Ship Ajax. And all that. You see, when you see films and see people flying, and there they're flying every Monday night on television, doing this spider woman, whatever it is, and so forth, it's one or two or three people flying. In Flash Gordon, in that scene that we attack rocket ship Ajax, that's three and a half thousand hawkmen alive on wires and wings, never before been done. So when I suddenly say Squadron 40 to Flash, oh well, who wants to live forever, Squadron 40? Now at that particular point, I've got this great bazooka in my hand, and I said, you know, on that day, right, Brian, it's taken weeks to get it ready, the special effects, here we go. Okay, stand by. Squadron 40, dive! Shooting, all the monsters, but they said, cut, cut, cut. Brian, we put in the special effects. <laughs> I've never, I've never felt such a tit in all my life. Pretty <laughs> come You've got to make a bloody noise, haven't you, you can't. <laughs> And that went on all the bloody time. I must say, ladies and gentlemen, that I, uh, <sighs> I always, uh, it was interesting that Ming the Merciless, unfortunately, is not with us at the moment. Uh, what, are, what, are you doing, what are you doing there, me handsome? City down, city down. <laughs> Ming the Merciless, in his death scene. Now, prior to that, in his opening scene, I was very flattered that Max von Sydow, one of the greatest actors who's ever lived, you know, uh, all those wonderful Swedish films that he did, uh, uh, brilliant with his blonde hair, etc. And start of Flash Gordon, uh, they placed me because uh, my wings were so solid, I couldn't sit in a chair. Uh, so they built me a rocker, you know, like a bird. So I was going up and down like this, with all the cars going, pretty poly, pretty poly, pretty poly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Max came over to me and said, um, Brian, I, I don't know how to play me. I thought, being a Shakespeare an actor, I was very flatter. I don't know how to play me the merciless. I said, well, I saw you in a film, Laquilla Memorandum, being a real evil torturer. And you used your hands. You cracked your fingers before you tortured him. It was frightening, really. And I said, Ming uses his hands all the time. Watch the film. You're a magician. And also a very sexual creature. He's always feeling the women. 
He's in a sex but At the beginning, he has to go at melody. Sam's girl at the beginning. Doesn't it? Do? I said, that's the only thing. It's your hands. So when you watch him in the film, he does come on always playing with his hands. That's because of me. Aren't I marvelous? Anyway. <laughs> so... And in death scene at the end, it was a Friday afternoon, I got my friend the dwarfs with me, about 15 dwarfs, who were always taking the piss out of me in all my shots. And then all these lovely dwarfs going, hee 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 hee. And we sat down, we had a cup of tea each, a last shot of the day, and that rocket ajax came through and went straight through Ming's body. And we were all having cups of tea behind the camera. Oh, that must be painful. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> But he pulled it out oh, and pulled it out eventually with his green blood. He said, You bollocks, he said to you, oh, you oh, He was absolutely furious with us because we'd taken the Mickey out of him with this kind of great rocket straight through his stomach. But we had that fun and lots of depth in it. Um, it's interesting that the cast were very sophisticated people. Uh, Shakespearean, national theatre actors, and all kinds of things. Uh, about that big fight, by the way, on rocket ship Ajax, I choreographed it. The choreographer, the fight arranger, became ill. So I thought, I'll do it. I knew all the stuntmen. And I, you know, I was third down Black Belt Judo, down Los Offensive. And so that fight on rocket ship Ajax, we're knocking hell out of people. I choreographed it. Aren't I marvelous? <laughs> you must admit it. So anyway, anyway. Maybe that is me. Uh, and so, it was very sophisticated kind of film all around, with very sophisticated actors in it. And an absolute miracle to be part of. I've been very lucky in that respect, in the fact that at the moment, uh, Peppa Pig has just been sold to the Chinese for 14 billion pounds. I get a small wage, but I'm Grampy Rabbit. <laughs> you, I, mean, you, I mean, I'm not nothing, you know, I'm not rubbish, I'm, I'm Grampy Rabbit. <laughs> I mean, I have a lighthouse, and when the boats get too near, and they're coming onto the rocks, and it's it's dark. What do I say to help them? Fog. Yeah. Fog! Marvellous! Lots of points for you, my old son. I'm Grampy Rabbit. So I'm lucky in everything I do. Um, I met George, uh, our directing, of course, uh, Star Wars. I mean, Star Wars, everybody wants to be in Star Wars, don't they? I mean, throughout. And I did the prequel, playing Boss Nass, the King of the Gorgons. A man! You can talk in a minute. Um, <laughs> I'm okay, I'm, I'm happy. Don't wait, don't wait. Honestly, stop interrupting me. Anyway, so. <laughs> so, anyway. George cast me as Boss Nass, the King of the Gorgons, about 30 feet high, and so forth. Well, I'm playing big mouth and all that, and so forth. And then as a George and a Lucas, a director. And there's that scene where you, you dream of it. I mean, to be in Star Wars, to play the big... I played the hero, Boss Nass, 30 feet high, with all my gungans. All my gungans. And then I was, and there was this great hill, and there are, uh, there's only one Kenobi and, and Qui Gon, uh, and McGregor's there, uh, and, 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 and uh, Neiman, he's there, they're all there, the princess is there, the queen's there, and they're all in front of me, and I've got George, the director, just over here, who never directs anything, he just puts cameras on it, he, he leaves, he trusts you completely. And I never told anyone this, so there I am waiting. And he said, Brian, this goddamn scene is so bloody boring. And they come to me to ask me to help them. Will I save them from the dark side? Yeah, McDiamond and all that. And, and, they, and they all gather. There's the queen, princess, a Jedi. Oh, I want to, what good for my ego? And there I am, 30 feet high, you know. And George said, do something, you know. And I looked at them and I thought, uh, I looked at them, maybe we can be friends. Maybe 
Maybe, maybe we can be friends. And George said, you mad bastard. <laughs> That's exactly what I wanted. And when you see the film, when you see the film, of course, uh, uh, you see me do that, do that ridiculous noise, uh, and uh, I lead the way. I become the great hero of the film. I, in actual fact, I have the last word in the film, don't I? They give me the prize. We defeat the dark side, and I arrive there on my big camel, whatever it is, 30 feet high, and I pick up this globe that they've given me. <clears throat> what do I say? Peace! Peace! <laughs> and that's the last shot in the film. So I've always been lucky that way. I, uh... <sighs> I, I told a little story to a, a young lady I just signed a photo for, and the fact that um, I, I've been in lots of films with Ken Branagh. We did Henry V, uh, with me as the Duke of Exeter in all this armor. Great, big, powerful, the Duke of Exeter, wins the Battle of Agincourt with his army, really, more than Henry, and so forth. And, uh, in the film, Paul Scorpio is the French king. But we did it on stage at Stratford on Avon. And Sebastian Shaw played the French king. And Sebastian was 95. Uh, and uh, I arrived one evening just for the manly performance, and there he was with his wife. Been, Sebastian Shaw was a big star of the 1930s and 40s. And there he was in the summer sitting there, and I said, hello, Sebastian. All right, looking forward to the afternoon performance? And he said, y yeah, yes, I am, yes, I, I am, Brian. I, I'm very tired. I, I've been working for two days on this film. Uh, what is it, darling? She said, Star Wars, darling. Yes, I've been working on Star Wars, and uh, I've been playing this character, and, uh, I'm all in black, and um, they put a helmet on my head, uh, and I, I had to unscrew it, it was very hot, uh, and then I took it off so that I could see my son and recognize him for the first time. What? What are you talking about? Well, I take it off, because... I see him for the first time, and I never have, you see. What was I playing, darling? She said, A Darth Vader, darling. <laughs> I said, what? What are you talking about? Sebastian, you're Darth Vader's face. You take the helmet off, and there he is. Hello. <laughs> Very sweet. Hello. And there he, I said, do you understand? All the films you did in the 1930s and 40s pales to insignificance compares to the fact that you are the face of Darth Vader. You are Darth Vader's face. You are him. Do you understand that this makes you legendary beyond any other actor ever? Why, well, I didn't know. <laughs> See, bloody hell of <laughs> You know, when I was doing some uh, space 1999s, I was in a cottage sitting there, and Dave Prowse walked past me. I've known Dave for years and so forth, uh, six foot six, six foot eight, and so forth. Uh, and they were doing the first film at the time of Star Wars. And he said, I'm having a terrible time. Uh, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this character, Darth Vader. <laughs> he said, and of course, Harrison Ford uses his own voice, he uses his own voice, Ali Guinness uses his own voice, but they, were, they won't let me use my own voice. <laughs> Why do you think they were really upset, Brian? They won't let me use my voice. He's six foot eight, what's, God was asleep. <laughs> when presenting him a voice. How could a man six foot eight, you know? And in the studio, I, I, I went to the side and watched it. Is it a great name for the Empire? 
Have you seen the end of Obi-Wan Kenobi? We must see the end of the revolution. I mean, is it weird a little voice like that? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I can't visualize why. <laughs> they haven't let you speak your own part. <clears throat> Bloody hell, my. I'm going on a bit here. Here we go. Um, but I love doing Boss Mass. It was great fun uh, uh, and a great character. So I've always been very, very lucky. I, 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 I tell you this now. I, I want to thank you first of all for one thing to begin with, for money. Because <laughs> I, this is me at my best in dress. I've got bugger all because of all my life, my wife and I, we have rescued animals. And my garden and my uh, uh, paddocks are full of ponies, horses, ducks, hens, dogs, cats, throughout the bloody ages. We look after all these animals. We never have a penny to scratch our asses. And so that's why I'm here. But I love science fiction. But I'm here because I need the money to feed all the bloody animals. So thank you very much. Oh, also, I also use a lot of your money for the Born Free Foundation with Virginia McKenna, all the lions and tigers and leopards and gorillas and so forth. I don't just work for myself, so I never stop working, because it's not, it's not about me. It's amazing what you can do in life when it's not about yourself. And I depend on people like you, and I find it refreshing. I don't get to many conventions, so to be in a hall or to be with you is quite something. I just did in the corridor, uh, Tarzan, yeah, the Disney Tarzan film, I just come down from Mount Everest, uh, and um, a, a really hard climb without oxygen. And I came to London, and they said, "Well, Disney are doing Tarzan, the animated version, and so forth." Uh, and all kinds of people are up for the villain in it, uh, Clayton. And so there's, I went to the studios, and there's Hopkins, and there's Patrick Stewart, and there's everybody. And I was insane because I'd just come down from 29,000 feet on Everest. And I was like this, I didn't know what I was. I'd make it noises and blah, blah, and say, hello, Tarzan, hello there, Tarzan, how are you? You like the gorillas, I like the gorillas. And, 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 and I did all that. And they said, people thought I was insane. Hopkins said it's the closest he'd been to dying. He fell, off his, he fell off his chair. I've never had a reading like him, right? Sean Connery but couldn't believe him. Thank you, Brian, they said, and so forth. Anyway, after about 10 weeks, some in the garden with the animals, and the guard said, well, by the way, that Disney thing, when you came back from Everest, uh, has that gone? I said, funny enough, I don't think it has. Because Clayton is the eight-foot powerful explorer who fights Tarzan, who kills the gorillas. Horrific character, Victorian hunter. And I said, anyway, they found out one, we offered it. We've never heard a reading like it. But <laughs> you talking to taking the piss out of Tarzan, <laughs> that's exactly what you would do with the gorillas, and you treat him as a gorilla. And we found that magical. So we're playing the part. So I did. It's a, it's a marvelous film. The Tarzan, if you've seen, of course, I'm wonderful. If you've seen the film. <laughs> anyway, um, when I'd finished filming it, or doing the voice of, 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 uh, as Clayton, I was leaving the studio, as this lady is over there, uh, and I could hear the man playing Tarzan. And he is the man who played in Ghost. He plays a villain in Ghost. A voice rather like that. Gold in his cold, isn't it? Lovely voice like that. Hello, Ta. Hello, Jane. Oh, lovely. So his villainous voice is really lovely for the hero Tarzan. You listen to it. I am the real villain in it. And so forth. Anyway, I've now finished. Brian, you've done a great job, said Roy Disney. You've done a great job, Brian. You've done a great job. And I'm just getting in the taxi, and I could hear in the background, ah, 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 
Ah, ah, ah. I said, what the hell's all that to Roy? Oh, don't talk about it, Brian. He's a marvellous actor, but he can't do the yodel. He can't do tar- Tarzan's yodel. We told him, when I was a little boy in Goldthorpe, Mexborough, this big, we saw Johnny Weasler. And when he appeared on the screen, we all yodeled. 2,000 kids yodeled. Well, well, well you could yodel, you know, then. Yeah. Now this is your turn, isn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I stepped forward and I did that and so I went. <clears throat> oh, 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 By the way, if uh, if you can do Donald Duck, you'll become a multimillionaire. Donald Duck faded away because they can't, people can't do it. Because they can't voice his words. Wow, wow, wow. Say, how are you? How, 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 how. It's very difficult. And of course, Mickey Mouse is very easy. Hello. <laughs> very, very easy indeed. So, if you have a chance, if you can do a Donald Duck, ring up Disney. But then it was, so when, when we did the premiere in uh, LA, I stood behind Tarzan's back and he had a microphone on his back. And I did the yodel into his microphone and he went, <laughs> no end to my talents. <laughs> but I want to say that uh, I'm here because I love science fiction. I believe in science fiction because it's becoming science fact. I have I've worked with uh, all kinds of astronomers, uh, left, right, and center, and to the, the, the latest ones, of course, uh, as well, uh, Brian Cox and all of them. And I, I'm always on the infinite monkey cage. And I, you know, I've become very kind of knowledgeable about space and this, that, and the other. So I'm doing all kinds of things to aid it, because I believe in it passionately. Um, I'll just hold it there for a while. Now, you ask a question. I've said enough. You ask a question, sweet folks. Yeah, I think we've got time for probably one question. It's, it's, oh, no, shit. This, this is why I love Wales Comic Con. Oh, shit! It should be. Who the thought you were going to tell me? I'm really I'm going to cry. What's the question? Hi, Brian. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure. I listened to you yesterday. You were on Radio 4 Extra. You did a three hour show. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Don't encourage you. I can't believe it. Three hours of my best. During which you mentioned you went to Space City in Russia. Yes. Any fond memories? Well, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, I'm, I'm percent explorer as well as actor. And so now I've completed my space training. I've been with NASA on the Union Island in the Pacific, training with them. So you want to put elder men into space, particularly men who love space and want to help space. Because I say we've got, that's where we belong. We're going to go out there. We don't just belong here. We are the children of stardust. We are yearning for the stars. And this is what I'm basically conveyed about the whole thing. And I have trained on Reunion Island in the Pacific uh, with uh, 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 their most advanced NASA teams. And I they also trained before Putin went off his head uh, in Moscow at Star City. And I have done complete training, and I'm a cosmonaut and an astronaut. I'm fully trained. And I'm 86 years of age. I will not. So I train. I train, I do weights, I can do 300 pounds, I do this. I train in my back garden with my, my own gymnasium, and I keep fit. This is why I've got all this energy and a love of life. But I am a fully trained cosmonaut, an astronaut, which is quite astonishing. Um, our film uh, was that when we went to Everest, I followed in Maori's footsteps where he disappeared on Everest. We filmed with a big team and so forth, me following Maori's footsteps. 
Uh, and the, it was called Galahad of Everest, the film. And it won all these awards. Uh, and they said, they firmed me up, uh, you know, everybody. And they said, Brian, you won Best Actor in the Tenerife Film Festival. Well, I don't tend to bloody win things. I'm given things, you know. A genius like me is given things. <laughs> With modern modesty as well. Uh, anyway, they said, Brian, you've been voted the best actor of the Tenerife Film Festival. And there was Sean uh, uh, um, Darcy with Wolves, what's his name? Costner. Uh, Kevin Costner, who played, of course, I play his father in Robin Hood. Uh, he was there, and Daniel J. Lewis was there, of course. Uh, 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 Lars of the Mohicans, wonderful actor. And they didn't win, I won for Galahad of Everest. I said, well, I don't, why are you giving me the award for best actor in Galahad of Everest? Because I don't act in it. I just climb a bloody mountain. <laughs> I actually had Daniel Day Lewis led us with laughter. And afterwards, anyway, I was given an award for it, and it was a lovely bone on a rock. I took it home, and my Jack Russell ate it. <laughs> <laughs> you mean butter? Little shit pot. <laughs> Eight my that's the only bloody thing I've ever won. And you asked me what you were saying, I'm not no questions. And so, uh, so the training there, uh, uh, Putin at the time wasn't like he is now, but they have Space City in Moscow uh, and Star City. They have cinemas, they have training, uh, they have hydras, and they have centrifuge that goes to 12 and 13 and 14 Gs. If you go to 13 Gs, <laughs> you become an amoeba and you're dead. <laughs> the bug has almost killed me. I went to 12 Gs in it and other machines that they don't use now, which are highly complicated and so forth. And I am now a fully trained cosmonaut and an astronaut and I'm going to go into space. I could be called now. Then I would go. This minute. I don't think it's going to happen in Moscow, of course, but certainly with NASA, they're putting together the most wonderful things. And at last, we're going to go out there because that's where we belong. So interesting that uh, you heard me on that and so forth. But the infinite monkey cage is wonderful. Wonderful. But so another question, please. Go just one more question. I, I think one more. <laughs> who am I to argue with Brian Blessed? Come on, who's going to have a question? It has to be quick. Yeah, go on, sir. Hi, Brian. Uh, is it true that when you went to the North Pole, you punched a polar bear? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the extraordinary thing with me is that people, you, you always get the doubters, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, you, so, I mean, I've mean, I done all this training and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When we went to the North Pole, 11 of us had marvelous British expedition from Resolute in Canada. And of course, that's where the polar bears are, uh, et cetera. The penguins are in the Antarctic. But the polar bears are up there, and it's their country. Uh, and they did, you know, the uh, members in our expedition did carry rifles. You don't shoot polar bears. It's their country. I'm, I'm worldwide life, Virginia McKenna, and World Society of Protection of Animals. You don't touch them. And so, uh, otherwise, I bloody kill you. I, I have to say, by the way, it was fierce. You talk about bad weather or hot weather and things like that. On Everest, you can go to 50 degrees above zero, hotter than the Sahara. Uh, uh, in the Antarctic, he, he, I, I had three women with me in my tent, brilliant, and they, they, they were in, an ins absolute inspiration. The women are doing so, I mean, I, women are my heroes, my heroines. Thank God they're appearing everywhere. I like women. I love women and learn, I've always learned so much from them. And on this expedition uh, to the North Pole, uh, we were pursued by polar bears. And I said, we don't hurt them, and this, that, and the other. And I was in a tent one night with the girls, uh, and it ripped open, and there was this great big polar bear. You know, of course, a bear or a lion or anything like that, they all hate being punched on the nose. So as it was there, and ran off. And I saved its life. <laughs> so I did, yes, punch a polar bear in the nose and it ran off. They don't like being punched on the nose. And I saved its life. I have to say, saving life, there are other things that I don't recommend, particularly to the men. 
When you want to have a P, uh, to, uh, you know, when it's 60 or 70 degrees below zero, you've got 25 seconds for a P. <laughs> now I have girls with me, and so I could have a pee, I've got to have a pee, quick, get, gather round, gather round, and they feathered my privates and feathered my private. I 25 seconds, I managed to have a pee, otherwise, within 25 seconds, if, they do, if you don't have protection, but the ladies on this occasion, going like this and going like that, to keep me, my penis warm, and then it will go black and fall off. <laughs> So what I'm saying is, going on expeditions is a pretty serious business. I won't begin to go on that thing that swims in the Amazon, that swims up men's penises and then opens up. So when you go on adventures, don't forget it can get a bit rough at times. <laughs> and so, uh, well, I, I, you finished asking questions. I mean. Um, we are answering your questions. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I love people who love life, who love space. As I said, I think that, you know, the primitive is so important. My wife, a long time ago, Hildegard Neal, Cleopatra, in Anthony and Cleopatra, the film with Charlton Heston, uh, she was Kate in England, made me, with Peter Finch, and uh, the man who wanted himself, Roger, uh, Roger's wife, uh, in that, and Hildegard, and so forth, and she adores animals, and uh, like I do, and she taught me to care even more and more for animals. She's been very ill, but she's getting better now. Um, she had cancer, she had pneumonia, she had heart problems, and now she's walking half a mile a day, and she's recovering very nicely, and so forth, which I'm you know, th thrilled to this. Hildegard Neal. And so she helps me a great deal and inspires me, and has always loved my madness. But in the early years, when she was this very beautiful Cleopatra, she was in my car, I talked intensely about life. And then I suddenly talked about the world heavyweight champion, Rocky Marciano, who never got beat, the great Marciano, about my size, Marciano. And I talked about his training routines, big weights on his arms in swimming pool, and no one was like him, savage, amazing boxer. And we've been discussing, you know, Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, all the Greek philosophers. And she looked at me and said, you really are a true primitive, aren't you? I mean that flattering, Brian, because there is nothing more sophisticated than the primitive. So tattoos, jewelry, the whole lot. Continue now to put them on whenever you feel like it. Be free. Because it's no different from the wild men of Borneo. Anywhere. We're bringing out very healthily our prehistoric nature, our atavistic nature. In a few weeks' time, I'll be at the Albert Hall towards Christmas and doing tubular bells. I hope you come and see it. And I'll be doing the caveman on it. <laughs> With the Royal Symphony Orchestra, very brilliant. <laughs> they're in for a rough time, they're in for a rough time. Do come and see it at the Albert Hall and around the country. Tubular Bells is the most amazing uh, piece of music ever written, I think. So, and, anyway, I wish you all the best. I, I, it's marvelous you'll be here. Continue, take up your adventures, your own personal adventures. You know, go for it. I think in life it's in April, go for it. And when people say you're mad, you know you're on the right track. Go for it. And don't let the bastards grind you down. All right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Leslie. What an absolute honor.